Who decides your personality? You, your parents, your friends, or Jordan Peterson? Personality, the one thing that prevents you from being awesome. If you're an introvert, how many times have you wished that you're an extrovert at a party? If you're neurotic, how many times have you wished that you're confident and calm at a job interview? There are many, many ways to measure your personality. In Japan, people measure personality by looking at the blood types or palm reading. Check this out. What kind of thing do you want to do? I don't know, this person is a bit dumb, I don't know, I'm a bit dumb, 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 I'm a These forms of personality tests are so popular in Japan that some people even decide whether or not to date a person based on their personality types. But how can you trust those things? Not just the method that they're using to measure personality, but also the very notion of personality itself. Do you have a one type of personality? Say an extrovert? And do you always act like an extrovert? Do you date a person because your friend says he or she has a good personality? I know what you want to say. It depends. But think about that very answer, it depends. If your behavior depends on the situations you are in, then do you actually have personality? To answer that question, let's take a look at science. The most scientifically studied personality test comes from personality psychology, obviously, and that's called Big Five. Big Five measures five dimensions that constitute human personality. Openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Personality psychologists measure those five dimensions by using questionnaires. Questions are something like, are you always prepared? Do you talk a lot? Are you relaxed most of the time? Do you have difficulty understanding abstract ideas? Or do you sympathize with others? If you tend to seek out social opportunities, you score high on extroversion. If you empathize with others, you score high on agreeableness. If you're always anxious, you will score high on neuroticism. If you like order and routines, you will score high on conscientiousness. And if you watch videos like this, you will score high on openness. By asking those questions, personality psychologists can identify your personality dimensions called the traits, an average pattern of behavior, thoughts, and feelings of an individual. So personality psychologists believe that there is an average tendency to behave across different situations. And that's against your it depends answer because personality psychologists think that your behavior is biased by your personality regardless of the situations. But how is the big five different from the blood type or palm reading? How did the personality psychologist come up with this idea? Let's hear from none other than Dr. Jordan Peterson. Wait, you know who Dr. Jordan Peterson is, right? Just in case you don't know who he is, here's an introduction. Who are you talking about? Jordan Peterson? Trending number one on Twitter, Jordan Peterson, <laughs> with an international, in an international bestseller, Jordan Peterson, right? You, you, you're doing well, but you're a mean, mad white man, and you're going to get us right. Yeah, there are so many things going on around him, but he is a solid personality psychologist and a clinical psychologist. So you can trust him on that point, roughly speaking. So let's hear how he describes the process of developing the Big Five. This is actually what happened when people developed the Big Five. 
So I'm going to give a very large number of people a huge set of questions that cover every element of their personality I can think of. It's agnostic, right? What I'm really trying to do is come up with the biggest possible set of descriptors that someone could actually fill out. Then I give them to a thousand people, agnostically. Then I do the factor analysis. Bang, five factors come out. And then the factor analysis tells me which questions load on each factor. And what the factor analysis is saying, here's 20 questions, and there's something about them that's the same. So then I read the questions, and I think, well, those questions are referring to something the same. What is that? Well, then maybe I talk to three colleagues, and we think, well, that's something like sociability. Bang, we have a name. And then we could go see, now that we have a measure of sociability, we could go associate it with other measures of sociability. Like we might say, well, are people who score high on this measure of sociability more likely to go to parties? And the answer would be yes. Because what happens if you take 10,000 questions about personality and randomly select sets of 100 and give each of them to 1,000 people and do a factor analysis, the first factor is extroversion. And it's the, it's the factor in human personality that seems to pick up the biggest amount of variance. And so, so then we say, from a statistical perspective, extroversion is real. Yeah, maybe he's a little mad. Anyway, so what's interesting about the process is that personality psychologists took all the descriptor words from an English dictionary, such as kind, anxious, or talkative, and asked the people whether those descriptors applied to them. And then, by using statistics, they found that those descriptors clustered together in five groups, which became the big five, roughly speaking. Now, he also says that personality is real because it's statistically real. But are you convinced of that? See, if you're a scientist, you begin your scientific study by observing a phenomena and then later on build a theory about it. But in the case of personality, you start by asking people questions about the personality and find that there are five things that people respond uniformly. And then from that, you infer the existence of personality. Now that begs the question of whether personality is real. In other words, if you are to take big five seriously, you have to believe in a set of assumptions. Now, are those assumptions believable to you? Let's go back to Dr. Peterson. I'm going to set forward a set of propositions, and you, you have to think about them, because each of them are they're axiomatic, so you sort of have to accept them before you go on to the next step, and there's certainly room to question them. But here's the bare bones of the psychometric model of personality, so we'll call it roughly the Big Five model. And the reason it's called the Big Five model is because the psychometric investigations have indicated that you can specify human personality along five basic dimensions. And so here's the hypo hypothesis part. And this is a critical thing to know. This is called the linguistic hypothesis. And the linguistic hypothesis is that variation in personality among human beings is of sufficient import so that it's become accurately coded in the lexicon. So what that means is that Roughly speaking, is that over the course of the evolution, or evolution of any language, we'll use English as the example here, descriptive terms have been generated that actually do cover the variation in personality and that essentially cover them without bias. Now, that's a hypothesis. Actually, it's an axiom. So, so that's the first thing you have to accept. You have to accept that it's possible to extract out what constitutes personality by looking at the linguistic representation of, of descriptors insofar as they're encapsulated in language. So the first assumption is that the descriptor was capture human personality. Is this reasonable to you? Here's another assumption. The weird thing about the big five, or one of the weird things about it, is that we don't have great tests for the traits independently of self-report for almost all of the traits. That is to say that when you measure your personality, you rely on your knowledge about yourself or of a person who knows about you. There is no direct test, whether it's a biological or behavioral, to identify your personality. That's interesting. What do you think? Next assumption. I started to talk to you about trait theory, and now I'm going to make a jump to biology. And that, that's a strange jump in some sense, because the, 
two levels of analysis are relatively disconnected. But the workers at the forefront of the field are trying to integrate what's being established at the statistical level of analysis with what's known at the psychobiological level. It's developed in a rather strange way because the traits that were identified that I discussed with you on Tuesday, the big five traits, all emerged as a consequence of the statistical analysis of, of descriptors, characteristic mostly of the English language, although it's been duplicated in other languages. So, in some sense, it was an atheoretical model, right? It just came out of the linguistic data. So there was no real initial inferences about brain area or neurological activity or, or anything like that to drive the formulation of the Big Five model. In, instead, the Big Five model came first, and then people started thinking, can this be put into alignment with what we know about the brain? So this is a third assumption. That is, personality is based on biology. When I say it's based on biology, I mean that the each personality trait has a direct link to a specific biological or physiological system. So the last assumption is that there is such a thing as personality. The personality psychologists began the search for personality based on the assumption that there is such a thing as a personality. Because personality is not something you can see, it's an assumption. So in order to take the scientific account of personality seriously, you have to take those four assumptions, at least. One, the words capture personality. Two, people's reports are accurate descriptions of their personality. Three, personality has direct link to biology. And four, that the personality exists. I have problems with those assumptions. See, the first rule of behaviorism is that we don't assume. We don't assume any hypothetical or unobservable things to be real. What if we don't assume any of those assumptions? What kind of a human condition do we see? Is it gonna be a crazy one or, or a good one? So let's take a look at the assumptions one by one. And let's start with the assumption that the personality is biologically based. That there is a straight line between the personality traits and specific biological systems. Now that's a rather strange idea because the personality is an average tendency and the biological systems are often very specific. But personality psychologists uh, casually put them together. We've, we've discussed the big five traits. Extroversion, that's sensitivity to positive emotion. Neuroticism, it's sensitivity to negative emotion. Not all negative emotions, mostly fear, anxiety and emotional pain seem to load on neuroticism. Um, Disgust, which is another negative emotion, <clears throat> seems to be more associated with conscientiousness, particularly its orderliness aspect. It seems that Dr. Peterson thinks that there is a straight line between a personality trait and the emotional system, just like in the Pixar movie. Nice one, Joey. Whoa! No way! We are not eating that. Discuss. It's fine. It passed the five second rule. The grape touched the ground. It's poison. Oh, come on. It barely touched the ground. Wait, what? You don't know barely what? touches the ground? Yeah. Stray dogs. Hold on. Toenail clippings. Yeah. Roadkill. Hippie. Uh, oh. Dung beetles. Stop it. You can't believe it. Uh, shouldn't we do something? <laughs> no. It's a grape. It's not like we're eating. Broccoli? Ugh, don't even go there. Or boogers. <laughs> You're evil. Or dog food. Shut your mouth! But the behaviorists are not convinced of such a simple relationship because we know that there are a lot going on between the level of biological system and the personality. So in between the personality and the biology, there is a behavior level. And at that level, there are a lot of situation-specific behaviors that come out as a result of an organism interacting with the environment. Now, those are situation-specific behaviors and not the general tendency. 
Now, Jordan Peterson calls those situation specific behaviors as micro routines or habits. Now, let's hear from him how those micro routines develop. So, for example, you know, a child learns how to breastfeed, its mouth is pretty wired up right at birth, okay? And, and the rest of its body isn't wired up very much at all, but its mouth is. And you might think, well, that's just a reflex, and that Piaget would agree with that. It's a built-in, it's something built-in that, that a baby can do right at birth. But even in the act of breastfeeding, the baby has to learn how to modify that reflex so that it gets along with its mother. So even at the very beginning with the most, you might think the most primordial acts, there's a sociological and influence and there's a mutual dynamic going on that's really, really important. So the baby is born with a sucking reflex and the mother tries to breastfeed her baby by placing her nipple at the baby's mouth. At the right angle, that will elicit a sucking response and the baby gets milk. Now this is a situation specific behavior because the mother's breast is a stimulus and the baby's sucking is a response. Now this is called an SR relationship. But after about four months, the sucking reflex will disappear. And after the reflex is gone, the sucking response becomes voluntary, which will be maintained by finding mother's breast and getting milk. A process of reinforcement. Now the reinforcement based response is also a situation specific behavior because the mother's breast is a stimulus, sucking is a response, and the milk is a consequence. You're not gonna say that a baby is an extrovert or introvert when he or she is trying to find the milk because this behavior is called upon by the situation. Let's take a look at another example. Here's an example. So you've got your four-year-old, you want them to clean up their room. And so it's full of toys. Let's say they're three and a half. You look at it, you say, look, you know, clean, clean this up, clean up your room. So you shut the door and you go away and you magically hope that when you come back, the room will be clean. But of course, the child has no idea in all likelihood at that age, or maybe it's two and a half, something like that. They don't know what clean up a room means. That's like way up here, man. It's like you told your child, <laughs> there's mass everywhere, be a good person, you know, and then you come back in half an hour and they're no better a person than they were, and you get upset. It's like you can't do that. You have to say, you see that teddy bear? And you know that that kid knows how to see a teddy bear, and they know how to pick it up because you've watched them see a teddy bear and pick it up, and you know that the child knows the name of the teddy bear. It's teddy bear. And so... You point to the teddy bear and you say, do you see that teddy bear? And they go, yes. And you say, that's good, pat, pat. And they get a little kick of dopamine. So that's a happy day for the kid. And then they smile at you. So you feel pretty good about that too. And then you say, you think you could pick up that teddy bear? And they say, yeah. And so they go over there. Not every kid, by the way. But they go over there and they pick up the teddy bear. And it's like, it's a good day for both of you. And then you say, you see that little space on the shelf? Because you know they know what a shelf is. And you know they know what a space is. And you say, take that teddy bear and put it in the shelf. And they go over there and they put it in the shelf. And then they look at you and you're smiling. And so the probability that they'll do that again is now increased. Again, a child's response of picking up toys is maintained by father's attention. Teddy bear, pick up father's attention. A situation-specific behavior. And the child accumulates many of those situation-specific behaviors as he or she grows up. So if you take children and then you watch them interact, then what you'll find is that the two-year-olds are by far the most aggressive of the lot. Okay, so then let's say you identify this cohort of aggressive two-year-olds, track them until they're four years old. What you find is the vast majority of the hyper-aggressive male two-year-olds get socialized perfectly well. So by the time they're four, they're temperamentally probably still more aggressive, but they've become civilized little monsters, so other people can tolerate them. And that means that they've had parents or peers or educational experiences that enabled them to learn how to interact productively with other kids and to bring their aggressive nature under control. She is a child with a rough temperament. He's exposed to the social environment and he learns situation-specific behaviors at each instance of socialization with each peer, with each adult. The basic biological temperament is modified by environmental contingencies at the behavior level, and this will continue all the way 
to adulthood. We're always playing games, always. And a game, you might think about a game as a microcosm of the world. And a small child's game is a tiny fractional microcosm of the world, but then you get up into adult games, and you could think about those maybe as multiplayer online games, that's one good representation, but even more sophisticated things like being a lawyer, say, or like working at McDonald's or any of those things, those are also forms of game. So it start, you start out not being able to play a game at all, then you can play a game with yourself, then you can play a game with a few other people, then you can play rule-governed games with lots of people, and then you realize that you make the rules and you can make new games. Even working at McDonald's and being a lawyer is a collection of situation-specific behaviors. Now, here's a question that we have to ask. What is the relationship between those situation-specific behaviors and the personality. Jordan Peterson seems to think that those situation-specific behaviors will give rise to personality. Because as you interact with other people, you inevitably tell them what you want and what you don't want. When they give you what you want and what you admire, you respond positively to them, you pay attention to them, you smile, you focus your thoughts on them, you interact with them, and you reward them for acting in a particular manner, and when they don't respond the way that you want, then you punish them with a look, or by turning away, or by rejecting their friendship, or when you're a child, by refusing to play with them. And so, we're engaged in the co-creation of personalities. I mentioned the determination of micro-personalities by fundamental underlying biological systems like defensive aggression and sexual desire and hunger and thirst and so forth. Those are all systems that can grab your perceptions, make you look at the world in a certain way, make you pursue something else in a certain way, and prime action responses that are in keeping with all of that. The, the traits seem to be something like higher order agglomerations of those more fundamental biological motivations. So Jordan Peterson thinks that there is some kind of hierarchy between the biology and behavior and the personality, where the personality is on top and organizing the situation-specific behaviors and the biological systems. A motivated state in some sense is like a little micro-personality. It's, it's only got one aim, it's, it's sort of a one-eyed micro-personality, you know, so it's only aiming at one thing, but it still has all the other aspects of personality. So, sort of, you know, for me that, that aligns nicely with the psychoanalytic idea that, you know, you're, 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 a, you're a loose aggregation of multiple fragmented personalities, you know, they're sort of coherently tied together at the highest level of analysis, but they can go off and do their own thing. You see that in situations, for example, like eating disorders, where the hunger system itself starts to become almost a spun-off part of the personality, and the rest of the personality then wars with that. And that's sort of, in some sense, that's like cortex versus hypothalamus. It is logical to think that there is something that's organizing multiple situation-specific behaviors and the biological motives. Otherwise, you're a puppet of the environment acting out incoherently. Assumption alert! Yes, that's actually one of the assumptions, namely, personality exists. It is the assumption that we want something that organizes our behavior. We want things to be coherent all the time. There's even a disorder called multiple personality disorder or in modern term, dissociative identity disorder. We see incoherent acts as disorder. Now, is this cultural or biological? No one believe me, I'm Mr. Funny to you, Mr. Funny. Whoa! Oh, sorry, Tommy. What's in the cup, Ross? Um, what is in the cup? Okay, it's coffee. Ice coffee? Tell me it's ice coffee. It, it's hot. Hot coffee! <laughs> you idiot! You gonna spill hot coffee all over me, huh? What are you, just a big, dumb, stupid, doofy idiot with a doofy idiot hairdo, huh? Huh? <laughs> Mm, going to the beach when it stays light real late. Yeah. Hey! Tommy! <laughs> Say, what's your favorite thing about summer? Ooh, I don't know. Probably the uh, smell of freshly cut grass. Oh, that's yeah. a good one. Yeah. <laughs> we don't like to be incoherent. 
But if we look at the behavior situation by situation, it's not that coherent either. In fact, our original answer, it depends, also reflects such a position. But we want to be coherent. We want to stay put. But why? Now that ties into the last two assumptions. The assumption that was capture personality and the assumption that the self-report of personality is accurate. The assumption that descriptor words capture personality is interesting. Who uses words and why? How do we learn to use a word? Jordan Peterson talks about how a child learns the concept of clean. So let's say, and that's what you're doing with the kid. It's like, clean up your room, be a good person. It's like, no, they don't know any about, anything about that, but they do know how to pick up a teddy bear. And then maybe you think cleaning up your room is a hundred things like that. And so you have to teach the child each one of those hundred things. And then they learn, this is the scheme. They learn what's the same across all of those different actions. That's clean, right? Pick up the teddy bear, put away the Legos, make your bed. What? Those have nothing in common, really. Like the motor output's completely different. But they, they fall under the heading of clean. But unless you fill the heading of clean with all the subordinate categories of the action perception sequences that make up clean, kid can't do it. So just like the child learns the concept of clean, he also learns to use descriptor words like shy or outgoing or hardworking. But for what? Well, to convey information about somebody to somebody else, roughly speaking. Hey, you should hire this guy, he's hardworking. Or hey, you should date him because he's so kind. And sometimes, in a very specific situation, you apply those descriptor words to yourself as well. What would each of you say is your worst quality? Well, I am a workaholic. <laughs> well, I push myself too hard. Well, it takes me a long time to learn anything. I'm kind of a goof off. Okay, that'll do. Little stuff starts disappearing from the workplace. That's enough. Why do you think you'd make a good pharmaceutical sales rep? Well, I'm a people person. People like me. Some of my favorite people are people. <laughs> I feel like I'm saying people a lot. People, 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 people. Okay, I'm done. You sure? People, yes. Are those descriptors accurate or capture everything? Well, you know the answer when you write your own resume. You may write that you're hardworking, but you know that sometimes you're lazy. You may write that you're a team player, but you hated everybody at your previous job. So why do we use descriptors? Because that's how we communicate. We use words to achieve some goals, but that doesn't really mean that it also reflects that personality is inside us, that there is this agent that's supervising and organizing those situation-specific behaviors. Then what if those two assumptions are not capturing personality itself, but rather are reflected on how and why we use words. Take a look at another culture and see if coherence is always required. Helen was a queen of Sparta who fell in love with Prince Paris of Troy and they together ran away to the city of Troy, which caused the Trojan War between Greeks and Trojans. When the Greeks won the war, Helen was brought back to Sparta and she lived together with the king of Sparta happily ever after. Yes, happily ever after. Although we think it's kind of weird, but ancient Greeks didn't think so. They thought that Helen was affected by Aphrodite, god of love, at the time that she fell in love with Paris. So after she returned to Sparta, no hard feelings about it. She's still the most beautiful woman in whole Greek world incoherent but accepted. So then, what if there's no personality? What if those assumptions are not valid? What if personality only exists in your own mind? This is where behaviorists go separate ways with Jordan Peterson. Behaviorists do not assume personality and behaviorists do not assume that there is something that's organizing and supervising our behaviors inside us. You could also re regard yourself in some sense 
as a loose internal society. So you could say you're a collection of subroutines. You're a unity, but you're a, you're a univer unity that brings together a plurality of subcomponents. And part of the constraints on how it is that you lay out your interpretation of the world is that you have to satisfy those internal subsystems. And so you have to provide yourself with food, and you have to provide yourself with shelter, and you have to provide yourself with water, and, and all of these things. And, and those are demands that are laid on you by the nature of your internal processes. And of course, how they lay themselves out as demands, and what the appropriate solutions to that is, to those problems are, is, is debatable infinitely. But you can see the constraints stack up. You have to satisfy your internal constraints. So they have to be brought into a unity. That seems to happen at least in part between the ages of two and something like between the ages of birth and four years old. Maybe even two years old. You bring yourself together into something that's sort of functioning as a unity. Then you have to turn that unity into a unity that can function in the social world. An alternative to this is that instead of the child's personality emerges at age four, it may be that the child's language becomes sophisticated enough so that the he or she can apply a descriptor word to him or herself. Instead of believing personality as an agent, behaviors think that personality is a word that we learn to use in a particular situation. In this case, our own behavior is the stimulus, and the use of descriptor to our own behavior is a response. So it's a situation-specific behavior. So there is no higher order entity like traits, but there are only situation-specific self-monitoring behaviors, roughly speaking. So is personality real? Does it exist? Well, this is how Jordan Peterson responds to that question. To determine whether or not a construct, so it's a hypo hypothetical psychological phenomena or entity, whether or not that's real depends to some degree on what it's good for, right? Part of the aim of science is prediction and control, and so it's useful to take a look at important life outcomes among human beings and to determine whether or not you can predict them because that's one way of testing whether or not phenomena that you've derived say from your statistical analysis both in the case of fluid intelligence or intelligence more broadly and in the case of the big five actually has the capacity to manifest itself in a meaningful way in, in the world outside of, inside the lab, that's, that's one domain of potential validation, but then outside the lab as well. So one way to decide if personality exists, aside from believing those assumptions, is to test its utility. How useful is this concept? Back in 1968, there was a guy named Walter Michel, and he had reviewed, he's a social psychologist, he reviewed the personality literature up to that point and concluded that the typical personality measure only predicted the typical performance measure at about 0.2. And that's actually remained relatively stable. And what Michelle said was, because it's only 0.25, let's say, you square that, that's 5% of the variance, you leave 95% of the phenomena unexplained, you might as well not even bother measuring personality. So in this case, he's talking about whether personality can predict success in life. And the outcome is that personality test, big five, can predict about 5% of the outcome. Is this enough? Well, Jordan Peterson talks about some utility to it in terms of job hiring, but I don't believe that for you and me in everyday situation, that's enough. So the utility criterion of personality says that it does not exist, at least between you and me in everyday life situation. But what about the conceptual one that we have been talking about all along? And so this is sort of you, right? This is your personality. It's this connect collection of subroutines that you've turned into a hierarchy, and then there's something at the top of it. And that's, that's a big question. Like what the hell should be at the top of the hierarchy? Because that's the ultimate question of unity. And, the, and the, the clinicians would say, well, it's the self-actualized person, or it's the self, or something like that. You know, that's, that's, the, that's the implicit and perhaps explicit ideal that you're aiming for. And you might say, well, is, does such thing exist? Does it exist? He seems to say yes, and I say no. Dr. Peterson believes in personality, and he believes in the assumptions that constitute personality tests. He believes that there is a higher order, supervising and organizing agent that governs situation-specific behaviors and the basic biological systems. On the other hand, behaviorists think that there is no personality. 
They don't take the assumptions that constitute personality tests. We just think that personality is a word that we use to describe our own behavior, a situation-specific self-monitoring behavior. But that leaves a question. If we deny personality, what about our sense of coherence as a person? What about our sense of self? What about our consciousness? Well, that's for another video. For now, this. For now, this. Jordan Peterson speaking roughly. Now, what happens to normal boys, roughly speaking? Imagine the aggressive two-year-old types. They get socialized, so their level of aggression goes down. And then they hit puberty and testosterone kicks in and bang, levels of aggression go back up. Because I believe that human males and females are in an evolutionary cognitive arms race, roughly speaking. And so as men get trickier, women get trickier to understand them. And then as women get trickier to understand, men get trickier to understand them. And so we've been chasing each other around. Why is it that smart people are at the top of dominance hierarchies? And the answer to that in part is because they get there first. Right? I mean, everything's a race, roughly speaking. As you, in fact, as you flatten out the sociocultural environment, say you take everybody and you provide them with optimal nutrition and optimal access to information, which you've pretty much done, by the way, with a computer, right? Because how are you going to give someone more access to information than to give them a web-enabled computer? That's it, right? There's, there's just no better. It's an infinite library. You can learn anything with it. So we're done. We've equalized the education landscape, roughly speaking. And then nutritionally, well, you know, yeah, some people eat badly and some people eat better. But the option to eat well is basically open to at least everybody in North America, roughly speaking. You've wiped out the socio sociocultural variation. And so, for example, now that I'm in my 50s, roughly speaking. Let's solve the Jordan Peterson puzzle. One of the things that I point out very clearly in the book is that you have a, an internal guide to meaning. It's, a, it's an instinct. It's a manifestation of something called the orienting reflex, which is a very deep instinct. Okay, so the meaning of life, so the meaning of life and the orienting reflex. So the orienting reflex is a reflex where when there is a change in the environment, uh, you will orient to that stimulus so that's the orienting reflex if there is a loud noise then you turn to that noise or if there is a change in the music then you orient to it and so how does that connect to the meaning of life okay um let's see so orienting reflex you look to well, what, what is the meaning of life in this case? So that is... I think he's talking about some kind of a self-actualization type as a meaning of life. So you will you want to try to achieve uh, the maximum potential as a person. So that's where the meaning of life is. And then this basic or orienting response, which is a reflex, reflex is is on the other all right so the puzzle is to connect those two okay um uh let's see so you orient to a change in the stimulus so that's a change in the environment if it's change you pay attention to it if it's no change then you don't pay attention to it so in other words in your life, if the life is the same every day, in a, a, every aspect of your life, then you don't pay attention to that anymore. Uh, you don't orient to it anything. You don't orient to anything. But there is a change, then you pay attention to that. Right? So that ma that change might you might bring you to a new aspect of your life, a new challenge to, 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 the, to who you are. And so when you get to, when you pay attention to that change in the stimulus in the environment, 
you necessarily force yourself to confront to a new aspect of life and if you keep on orienting to a new aspect of life because when the new change in the stimulus becomes constant then you lose that orienting reflex right so and then so if you keep on paying attention to well it's a reflex so you kind of don't pay attention voluntarily just you kind of reflect to it but if you keep i think what he's saying is he's trying to say that if you keep paying attention to the changes all the time you are exposing yourself to to a new situation with a new challenge and that will bring up your potential you will learn something new you will um, learn to behave in a new situation and you will necessarily stimulate your um, potential so that if you keep on doing it then you will uh, become a better person or you will become more let's say you will become more um, capable uh, and that if you keep on doing that you will eventually get to the point where you are fully uh, self-actualized and that's the meaning of life so that so that that transformation for him is is the meaning of life how's that is that correct i'm not sure that sounds like a good good answer to me all right bye <laughs>